Maz Jobrani is arguably one of the most well-known and well-loved comedians in the Iranian-American community, both young and old. His family immigrated to California from Tehran when he was only six years old, and he draws a lot of his comedy from his experience growing up as an immigrant whose parents tried their best to fit into American culture while still retaining their, root, their Iranian roots. For example, he makes fun of Iranians for calling themselves Persians, like the cat meow, instead of Iranian, to avoid any bad connotations. Maybe the Iranian Google ERG should put like, some cat sign on their t-shirt too. <laughs> But just speaking of Iranian Googlers, I hope folks that are watching us live from Mountain View are not snoring over there. We have weekly Persian lunch on Fridays in Blaze Cafe, and they serve a variety of Persian appetizer on Tres desserts and a drink called Dour. What it does, it makes the uh, rest of your day very productive by putting you in a few hours of deep sleep. <laughs> Good for Fridays. Embedded in Ma's comedy is a sense of social justice. His fir he first became popular on YouTube with jokes, begging the media to show Iranians on TV making cookies instead of threats of violence. He always has a way to turn bad situations into jokes, uh, like naming his comedy uh, group the Axis of Evil when George W. Bush named Iran as a part of the Axis of Evil. Uh, he also knows uh, when to take his activism seriously, such as his refusal to play any terrorist roles in films, and his recent involvement in protest, protests against the Trump administration's travel ban. His recent achievement includes writing and starring in Jimmy Westwood, American Hero, a silly tour through the life of an Iranian immigrant as he navigates the crazy world of Los Angeles, Iranian community, and his LA, best, uh, LA Times best-selling memoir, I'm Not a Terrorist, but I've played uh, one on TV. His new Netflix one-hour comedy special, Immigrant, and one of the stars of the CBS series, Superior Donuts, um, season two premieres in October. It's hard to ever, ever uh, overstate how much it means for the Iranian-American community to have Maz represent us so well while standing up for us and making fun of us at the same time. He's an incredibly sweet guy, with one Googler um, mentioning to me that when he was 12, uh, he would regularly send Ma's fan mail, and it meant the world to him that his hero would actually reply back and even send him an autograph, signed, of course, with Meow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Ma's Jobrani. Hello, hello, Google. Uh, you guys don't work, do you? Um, this is amazing. It's my first time uh, on this campus. I went to the Nor Northern California one as well. And uh, yeah, you guys, they feed you. And there's games. And then seminar. You got a nap room. And wow, well, it's a good job. Great. Uh, there's literally a table with money up to upstairs. You, guys, you, you, you see that? You can just take money. Fantastic. What, what, what did you say? What? Massage. Massage. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how does anyone know how much work do you, you guys do? Does anybody... You, 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 no, nobody knows? Yeah, all right. Well, this is cool to be here. I actually, like, I, don't, I didn't really know what this was um, uh, until I got, uh, Hadi got in touch and said, come give a talk. Uh, who, who thought it was a stand-up comedy show? Uh, by, yeah, okay, no, it's not going to be. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a lecture on the history of Iranian and uh, of Iran. And uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, Iranian Googlers. I guess there's, this. I'm proud of you guys, Iranian Googlers. There's a handful of you. Fantastic. Like four of you wearing the T-shirts. <laughs> the rest of you're like, lay, no, bro, just lay low. There's a travel ban, man. We're, <laughs> we're Greek Googler. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. Uh, Google Iranian. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that there's. I mean, it's, I mean, as, Iran, as an Iranian, you always get excited when you see other Iranians, you know, doing well. So to see you in Google, it's great. And and I, I think you should like you can start your own. Like it's, you should have a better name than Iranian. Like you should be Gugush, who's like a Persian diva. You could do Gugush or Dudul, um, which means penis. Anyway, um, I uh, uh, this is cool. Um, 
No, so I, uh, like I was saying, I, uh, um, I, I didn't really know what this was, but it's, I guess it's a talk, and I, and, I, and I got invited. I get invited to do a lot of stuff by other Iranian-Americans because there aren't that many Iranian-American comedians. There's like three of us. It's like me, uh, a guy named Max Amini, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. That's all. There's, uh, so I, I get the invite. Uh, so, and Mahmoud's in retirement right now, but he might come back. Um, uh, but no, it's actually interesting to me, and, and, and I know there's different ethnicities here, uh, and, and we all have, like, you know, like, where's my Indians? Indians? Where's the Indians? Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I, you know, you got to be here. Yeah. You guys have, like, Russell Peters, right? You got Russell Peters, right? And then, uh, are there any Filipinos? Any Filipinos here? Any Filipinos? Asians? Any Asians? Asians. Asians. No Asians? We're at Google? What's going on here? Uh, there, what, what kind of Asian? What kind of... Vietnamese, you, you don't have, there's no Vietnamese community. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, there's actually a guy named Dat Fan, there really is. It's just interesting, because like, I think people find the comedian within their group, and they go to see what he's got to say. And for me, it's interesting, because being one of the only Iranian-American comedians, like, I think some Iranians, uh, they, they, they treat me like a jukebox, meaning like they make requests on what I should talk about. So like, I've been doing a lot of Trump jokes, because, you know, he gives us a lot of stuff to joke about. And uh, as an Iranian American, I mean, it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> let me just tell you, as a comedian in general, Trump has been hard because it's hard to keep up with him. Because, no, really, because as, cause as comedians, we need time to develop our jokes. So we'll come up with a joke and we'll be like, okay, this is going to take three months till I refine it and get it right. But by the time you do a joke about Trump, he's already on to another thing like it's cra it's hard it's impossible to keep up with the guy you know what I'm saying so it's been really hard to keep up with him and so I would do jokes about how some Iranians actually voted for Trump I know some Iranians that some immigrants in general voted for Trump because they wanted fewer taxes they ended up with fewer relatives but <laughs> these things happen it happens right uh, but no, so I'll make fun of Trump, and then inevitably at a lot of these events that I've been at, I've been at like fundraisers for, um, for Iranian uh, uh, charities, and inevitably there's always some Iranian uncle who will come up offended afterwards, like, Maz, why are you making fun of Trump? Why are you not making fun of Islamic Republic of Iran and Hassan Mohani, Hohani, Sohani? And um, I'm like, nobody knows who Hassan, Hohani, Hohani, like whoever, like these people are so upset at me. Like, why are you making fun? And they use me as a juke. You should make fun of the parking space on Westwood and uh, Ohio. Always give me the ticket. Um, you should make fun of my mother-in-law. I hate her. She's a bitch. Uh, <laughs> So I get requests, and I'm like, dude, just, you know, if you're so uh, uh, pro-Trump, do your own material and leave me alone. Um, but Trump has been, uh, as an Iranian and as well as any other immigrant, uh, we all know, it's been tough. Because a lot of immigrants, actually, when I was in the elections, when I was doing Trump jokes, uh, I was in Houston one time, and, and I was saying uh, Trump is anti-immigrant. And this one guy, he was a Lebanese guy, he raised his hand, he goes, he's anti-illegal immigrant. And I was like, oh, so you're legal. And I go, great. And I go, what's your name? And he's like, it's Hossein. And I was like, good luck to you, Hossein. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and we saw, he just did the whole thing with now the, he, they want to uh, bring, they want to cut down on legal immigration, right? And one of the things they said was uh, English, speaking English is going to be a big part of legal immigration. And I'm married to an Indian woman. So I know Indians are very good with spelling. Uh, so if English is part of, there's going to be a lot of Indians coming in at the border, they're going to be like, you know, spell ubiquitous. I would gladly spell ubiquitous. But <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Iranians, we have a hard time with our, like, W's and V's. You know, Westwood becomes Westwood. No, one's, no Iranians are going to get in. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, it's, uh, it's been interesting. So now, and then they, they, just, they just introduced Travel Ban 3.0, right? And, and to, to make, because to, they wanted to say it's not a Muslim ban. So they added North Korea. I mean, really? I didn't know we had anyone coming in from North Korea, but I guess the two guys that were coming can no longer come. And, uh, and it's diplomats from Venezuela. So, okay, it's not a Muslim ban. Okay, sure. Um, um, I actually was so upset with the whole Muslim ban thing that I actually went to a protest. I do this in my stand-up, but it was true. I actually went to LAX. Not this LAX. Isn't this room called LAX, by the way? Very confusing, because my manager said the talk is in LAX. So I was like, that's a weird place to do a talk. <laughs> I was like, Google has that much money? They bought LAX? <laughs> yeah, it's in Terminal 4. Uh, 
Yeah. No, and, and we got here, and I was like, the room is called LAX. Thank you for the, uh, c uh, uh, you know, confusion. But um, yeah, I, I went to LAX for the pro. Did, did any of you guys go to the protest that was in? Uh, I think it was February or March, right? You were there, right? It was great, and I got there, and I'm marching, and I'm feeling good, and it was, you know, I felt it was this. I, I was, I happened to be at the women's protest the week before. I accidentally ended up at the women's protest. I supported it, but it was that my daughter had a birthday. She's six years old. Her birthday was near the women's protest, so we went and we got there early, and and I was there with my daughter and my son. He's nine, and we said, hey, let's go to the women's protest so you guys can see what's going on. This is, you know, people are are, are marching and protesting, and this is what America's about. And it was actually kind of interesting because as we were walking towards the women's protest, we had an hour before the birthday, so we walked towards there. And I asked my son, the nine-year-old, I said, do you know why so many people are protesting? And he goes, yeah, I know because people are, women are upset because uh, Trump called women a chick. Um, uh, yeah, like chicks. Um, and Because my wife hates it when somebody calls women chicks. And I was like, well, kind of. <laughs> He said, grab them by the, we'll talk about it later. But uh, so we went and we did that protest. And the next week I went to LAX and I'm, and I'm marching and I felt good. And this guy came up to me. He's like, bro, this is amazing. You know, this is the most diversity I've ever seen in Los Angeles. And I was like, uh, bro, that's because we are at the airport. Um, <laughs> people are literally flying in from around the world as we speak. He's like, yeah, but there's Asians. I go, that's because Air Asia just landed. You think all these people show up at a protest, you know, uh, with luggage, you know? <laughs> One Korean guy, he's just trying to cross the street. He ended up in the protest. He's like, hey. he's like, Trump must go, but so must I. <laughs> he's trying to get out of the airport. And then, uh, and then I, I, actually, I actually realized something at the airport. Um, I realized that white people born in America protest differently than people of color and other people not born in America. Because we were all marching and everything was going great. We're all marching, everything's feeling great. And then the riot police came out. And I was like, oh, snap. Uh, I'm just going to go protest over here for a second. <laughs> but the white dudes did not care. They just kept out of my way, copper. Here I come. It's my right to protest. Here I come. <laughs> it's my third amendment, right? My ninth amendment. He knew the amendments. It's my 45th amendment. <laughs> I'm in the back. There's 45 amendments? I actually saw a white guy with his finger in the face of the riot police going like this, and the riot cop was grabbing the baton, like ready to grab his baton. And I'm in the back, I'm like, calm down, white guy. You're gonna get us all in trouble. <laughs> the Mexican guy next to me was like, uh, now's a good time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but it keeps coming, it keeps coming. And my story, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of times when I do these talks, I talk about just, uh, it's an immigrant story. I think a lot of us have it. And unfortunately, a lot of people that have never met an immigrant think that we're out to get them, but we aren't. Uh, we came to America because we love America. Uh, I came to America late 1978. It was the uh, uh, re revolution was happening in Iran, and we came to America. And I was six years old at the time, and uh, my father was a successful businessman, so he was on business in uh, New York. He was staying at the Plaza Hotel in New York. And a lot of Iranians have a similar story, the ones that came around that time. None of us thought that a revolution was going to happen. So my father just sent for my mom to bring me and my sister to New York for our winter break for two weeks. And I always say we came for two weeks, uh, we packed for two weeks, and we stayed for 40 years. Um, so it was pretty crazy. And we were, we were staying at the Plaza Hotel in a suite, and it was right across the street from FAO Schwartz, which was the biggest toy store in the world. And I remember as a six-year-old, I was like, wow, this revolution's really working out for me, you know? <laughs> I'm going to a toy store, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and it, was, it was interesting, you know? You don't think about it. I've, I've just started to really reflect upon it. But, it, but it's, it's interesting for, you know, as a kid, it was, it was interesting. But also, you don't realize the devastation that that causes because it's a big loss to just leave your country and come to America. Um, but, uh, but we came... And, uh, and, uh, and then we, we ended up leaving New York and, and, and settling in Northern California. And again, at the time, I know that a lot of Iranians have been coming over more recently. And unfortunately, with all this travel ban stuff, I think that they're trying to slow it down some. But we'll see what happens. But a lot of, most of the Iranians I meet are good people. Most of the immigrants I meet are good people. And we ended up in Northern California, um, where at the time, in the late 70s, early 80s, 
there weren't that many Iranians. There was like a handful of Iranians. And again, I don't know how it is for you as an Indian, but back then for an Iranian in Marin County that was mostly white, like if you ran into an Iranian, it was an event. It really was. So you show up, like I, was at, I went to a couple times to a deli and the guy, like I'd order and I could recognize the accent. So I'd be like, yeah, you know, I'll have a sandwich. And the guy would be like, would you like anything else with the sandwich? And, and, and then after a while in Persian, I'd be like, are you Iranian? And he'd go, yeah, are you Iranian? I was like, yeah. And like we'd hug it out and like, I swear, they'd always like throw in like a free cookie or something. And I, and I had an American friend, this guy, Mark, who would come with me like a couple times. And he's like, dude, you keep getting free stuff everywhere we go. And I'm like, well, it's just, you know, they, you know, it's part of the culture, you know. So it was interesting because I grew up over there uh, and then ended up moving down to L.A. after college. And Los Angeles is the biggest population of Iranians outside of Iran. Uh, so in L.A., people are used to seeing Iranians. And I, and I was, got a job in Westwood. I remember one of the first times I saw an Iranian, I was so excited. I was like, are you Iranian? And the guy was like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So does everybody else. <laughs> I was like, why are you talking like that? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it, the, the other thing that was interesting was, and I think this has all been, for me, it's been an exercise in, um, in identity because I grew up around, like I said, it was a very white, affluent uh, county, Marin County. Um, and my father was this larger-than-life Iranian man. So we show up, and uh, the rich people in Marin drive around in sobs and Volvos, very subtle with their wealth. Here comes my dad, buys a Rolls Royce, like around the hostage time, like hostage crisis. And I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? And he's like, I wanted the Rolls Royce. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to get me, you're going to keep my ass kicked. And, um, and uh, we ended up, uh, it, was, it was right around then. It was like I was in the fourth grade and the hostage crisis happened. And... Uh, that's when, and this is again another reason why I was just talking to uh, Masood here outside about. I think one of the reasons why I have such an emotional reaction to Trump is because I see him as a bully. And uh, I, as, when I was in the fourth grade, that's when uh, the hostage crisis happened, and we would get bullied. And I was in the fourth grade, and there was a sixth grader back then. And back then they used to call you a uh, uh, fucking Iranian. That was the thing. And uh, and so we would get bullied. And so I feel like. That's my reaction now to these bullies of, you know, because now what happens is when somebody commits an act of terrorism, like, you know, they go after all Muslims, Iranians and Arabs and even Indian, Indian Sikhs, you know, get a lot of it. Uh, so to me, it blows my mind that these kids that were picking on us when we were kids couldn't differentiate that we had left Iran to get away from the people who took the hostages and yet they were beating us up. Um, so um, that was, you know, uh, uh, Marin County back then. And, um, and then again, it becomes this identity thing. And now a lot of you guys obviously that work here, you're engineers and your Iranian or immigrant parents are proud of you um, because you became an engineer. And that's what my parents wanted. They wanted like lawyer, doctor, engineer, and I became a comedian uh, because they didn't know, they didn't know that. They didn't know that was an option. And so I was uh, around, uh, I'd say, 10 or 11 years old. Eddie Murphy was big, and I became a big fan of Eddie Murphy's. And then at 12, I started doing, I did a play in school. It was a musical, and I did it. And as soon as I got on stage, I felt alive. I loved being on stage. And we would do our plays for the school. And again, here comes my immigrant family. Immigrant families, by the way, are an interesting thing. I realized this recently because I have my young kids. I go to their school events all the time. Uh, I was at a fundraiser recently, and I realized my parents never came to any of my fundraisers. And then I realized I didn't want them to come to my fundraisers. Because when you have immigrant parents, like, when they come to your fundraiser, they out you, you know? Like, because they, they walk in like, hello, we are immigrants. You know, you're like, dad, shut up! You know, they thought I was one of them, you know? Um, in Iran, we also had fundraisers. Dad, nobody likes Iran! <laughs> this was 40 years ago. Still, nobody likes Iran. Anyway. We need a new ad campaign, right? Iran, it's better. Um, uh, but uh, but I, I realized uh, that, uh, like I said, that, that um, uh, it was always the, the identity thing, trying to Americanize, but having this immigrant family. So we would, I'd do these plays, and um, again, Marin County and everyone else's parents would show up at the play dressed, you know, maybe khaki pants and a button-up shirt, looking pretty nice. 
here come the Iranians, fur coats, like they're at the, the Metropolitan you know, Opera or something. <laughs> Fur coats, you know, cravat, the tie, you know, they're all like, they're all, you know, with Rolls Royce. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, please, guys, can't you just like come normal? And, uh, and then they would, uh, and here's the thing though, I actually was pretty good at, 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 at doing, at, at acting. And, and then the, the uh, director would tell them afterwards, I remember a few times I was after the show, I played Little Abner in eighth grade. And for those of you who don't know who Little Abner is, he's like a, Country, country boy, little Abner talks like this. And so I was this Iranian guy playing little Abner. And I was like, this is pretty cool. You can be anything um, until I came to Hollywood and played terrorist parts. But that's, <laughs> that's, that's coming. Um, no, but the thing with uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the plays, we would finish the plays and uh, I'd be backstage and I was the lead. And the director, I remember the director a couple of times telling my parents, Hey, your son is good at this. He's, he could do this for a career. And my immigrant parents might, you know, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay. We get in the car, and my dad would be like, that bitch is crazy. You know, like, <laughs> you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor or engineer, maybe. You know, like, they really were stuck on that. Um, and I think it's because they don't really know that this could be a career. And, uh, and also, I've, I've tried to uh, encourage a lot of uh, immigrants to kind of lay off their kids and let them find what they love to do. You know, like when I would tell my mom, this is what I love doing, you know, she'd be like, well, I would love to do a lot of other things too, but you gotta pay, you know, pay the bills, you know, so be a lawyer. Um, and so I actually went to uh, UC Berkeley to, to I, studied, I studied poli sci and I thought I'd be a lawyer. And then um, my junior year uh, in college, I went to Italy to uh, study abroad. And while I was there, there was this professor and I loved what he was doing. His name was, uh, Enzo Pace, uh, Vincen Vincenzo Pace, and he would he had a he had the goatee and the the blazer with the elbow patch, and he actually had a gold gold watch, you know the pocket watches, and he would r rip it out before the he pull it out before the class, and he'd wait for the time to start, and then he'd close it and be like, allora, let's you know let's start, and I was like, wow, this is cool, so I was like, that's what I want to do, so I came back to uh, the U.S. and I told my mom, hey, I'm going to be a professor. And my mom was freaking out. She's like, there's no work for professors. You need to be a lawyer. And I was like, mom, how do you know about the professor job market? You don't know about academia. And she was just really uh, nervous for me. And then I dropped out of the PhD program. I got into a PhD program at UCLA. I dropped out of that. And then my mom was like, because I dropped out to pursue acting again. And she goes, you did not become a lawyer. You did not become a professor. She goes, at least become a mechanic. I go, how'd you go from, <laughs> how'd you go from lawyer to mechanic? And she goes, you know, she goes, people need a mechanic. Nobody needs an actor. And I was like, you know what? That's pretty wise. You're right. And I realized, again, listen, all of us can reflect on our relationship with our parents or where we are in our lives. And, and looking back, you find out why you do what you do. So my mom, I think, was nervous about my future because she'd come from, a world where her world was turned upside down. The revolution turned her world upside down when she was already a grown-up. And so in her mind, a revolution might happen in America. And when it does, if you're a mechanic, you can go to another country and work as a mechanic. But if you're an actor, what are you going to do? Because we had a lot of Iranian family friends who were successful you know, military people or whatever, and they were working at gas stations, you know, in America, like the, like the movie House of Sand and Fog, like it was like that. So that, that's what she wanted from me. So anyway, I, I dropped out, and, um, um, and then I, I, again, I still trying to be a good Iranian or immigrant son. I got a job in an office. I started working in an advertising agency, and um, I was working in the ad agency and also doing theater uh, on the side. And I was in my mid-20s, and that's when I realized, I, I was talking to this older gentleman at the ad agency, and he said, listen, um, I told him that I love doing acting. And he'd seen me do something, and he goes, have you ever thought about doing this professionally? And I said, you know what, throughout my life I wanted to do it professionally, but my parents kept pushing me in another direction. I said, you know, when I'm in my 30s, I'm going to save up some money and maybe pursue acting. And he goes, listen, I'm in my 60s right now. There were some things I wanted to do when I was in my 20s, and I never got around to doing it. So because if you really want to do it, you should do it. And it was a light bulb moment, and I went for it. So I started getting into acting and stand-up classes. That was almost 20 years ago. 
And then I got into Hollywood thinking, hey, I played Little Abner. Uh, and also in high school, I played Batman. So I'm sure in we did a play, a musical. It was fun. Anyway, <laughs> it, was, it was a fun little thing. I got to be Batman. So I was like, hey, this is cool. As an actor, I get to be anything. And I came in, and I started going on auditions. And like the first audition was just a regular security guard job, uh, uh, part for a security guy. Uh, and then the second audition was for a Chuck Norris thing. And then uh, ended up a little while later, I didn't end up doing the, uh, doing the Chuck Norris thing then, but then a little while later, I ended up getting cast to be in a Chuck Norris movie of the week where I, where I played an Afghan terrorist who was going to blow up a building uh, in, uh, in America. And I was really debating, even back then, I, was, I still had my day job, but I was looking for a job that would help me get out of my day job, and this would have helped me just financially. And even back then, I was a little divided. I was like, do I really want to do this? And this was like, 19, this was 2001, before September 11th. And I, I, I told myself, you know what? I will do the part. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show through my acting why this guy is doing what he's doing. Like, I was going to humanize the terrorist in a Chuck Norris movie somehow. <laughs> I'm such an idiot, man. I really. Because I showed up, I was like, because I, cause I went down to, uh, it, was, it was being filmed in Dallas, and I went down to Dallas, I went to the wardrobe fitting, they go, here's your shirt, here's your pants, here's your turban. And I go, oh, I go, uh, you know, I've, I've been studying this part, and, um, you know, Afghans in America don't wear turbans. I go, Indian Sikhs wear turbans, we should get this right. And the lady goes, well, the producers want you to wear the turban. I go, yeah, I know, but you tell the producers, this actor's done his research, we should get it right. And then the next day I showed up, and um, the, there was the pants, the shirt, and what looked like a scarf. And I was like, yeah, I'll gladly wear a scarf. And they're like, no, that's the turban. You just got to roll it back up. Um, <laughs> so I ended up wearing the stupid turban. I felt like the biggest idiot. And I was on set like talking to anybody that would listen, because Chuck Norris's son was the director, um, and his brother was the executive producer. So I went to the son, who was younger, and I go, listen, dude, I shouldn't be wearing a turban. And he's like, bro, I don't want you to wear a turban either, but my uncle, who's more old school, wants the turban. Because I think to the uncle, the turban meant like the viewers can watch and be like, oh, that's the bad guy. Um, so I played in that, and I felt really bad. I felt horrible coming out of it. I was like, I don't ever, ever want to do this again. Told my agents, I said, I don't want to play these parts again. Um, and then the TV show 24 called. And they said, it's a terrorist part. I said, no, thank you. And they go, but he changes his mind halfway through the mission. I go, ooh, the ambivalent terrorist. That's interesting. <laughs> so I did that. And, uh, and they killed me in that as well. I kept dying, uh, obviously. Uh, my mom was like, why do you keep dying? Uh, I was like, that's how they wrote it. Well, why did you kill them one time? Uh, yeah. So that was the last terrorist part I, I played. And uh, I said, no more terrorist parts. And then meanwhile, I was doing stand-up. Stand-up is great because you get to express yourself and present yourself as who you are, so, and your ideas and your opinions. Um, and so uh, I was doing stand-up. And one thing happened that was interesting to me that was um, the comedy store on Sunset is like a mecca of stand-up comedy. Uh, and it's a place where all the biggest names from Jay Leno to Jim Carrey to Eddie Murphy to Richard Pryor uh, Letterman, all those guys went to the comedy store. And one of your goals as a comedian is to become a regular at the comedy store. And what that means is you do uh, an, your act in front of the owner, Mitzi Shore, who's Polly Shore's mother. She would sit in the back on a Sunday night and she would watch you do three minutes. They'd have an audience there, but you'd be up there at an open mic. You'd do your three minutes. If she liked you, she'd say, come back next week and do six minutes. If she liked you, come back next week and do ten minutes. So you just got to build it up. And so I kept going further and further. This is in 2000, or 99 maybe, I forget exactly. But she, uh, she watched me, watched me, now I'm doing my 10 minutes. And she would sit in the back of the room. If any of you guys have been there, it's an interesting room because there's, uh, there's these chairs in the back right next to the exit. And she'd sit right next to the exit. You have to pass her. And in passing her, your whole hope was that she would reach out and grab you. Because if she did, that meant she's about to tell you you're a regular. And what a regular means is now it's like, it's like the mafia. You've been, a, you've been made. You're, you're a made man. So regular means you get to come and perform at the club on a regular basis, and you're in. You're, you know, this is, 
the mecca of comedy and you're now part of it. But if she doesn't grab your hand and she lets you walk past her right through the exit, that means you got to show up, you know, go for six months to a year, work on your act, come back. So I did my three, I did my six, I did my 10, and I finished. And at the time, I would do jokes about being Iranian in America and, and all that. And at the time, she did not have any other Middle Eastern comedians at the club. There really wasn't that many of us. There was like two other guys. So I finished my set, and I'm walking, and I'm walking towards the door, and I'm like, please grab me. And then, and then suddenly, I feel her hand grab my arm, and I'm like, oh, my God. And like all these thoughts go through your mind, like, I'm going to be a regular. This is great. And like in your mind, you're like, I'm going to get a TV show. I'm going to get an Academy Award. This is amazing. And she grabs my hand, and she pulls me down. And now, meanwhile, someone else, you know, she's kind of quiet. She was getting older as well, but she's quiet anyway. And someone else is already performing on stage. So she pulls me in. She goes, you're very funny. And that's how she talks. You're very funny. And I go, thank you, Mitzi. She goes, I'm going to make you a regular. I go, thank you, Mitzi. And then she goes, have you ever thought about wearing the outfit? And I go, uh, what outfit? She goes, you know, the hat and the gown. And I was like, the hat and the gown? And she goes, yeah. And I was like, and I realized she's asking me to wear a turban and a dishdasha on stage, like as a character. And I was like, uh, sure, yeah. And I, and I thought, because she's older, I thought, you know what? I'll just say yes for now. And by the time they get me my first time on, you know, my first gig, she'll forget, right? So I walk down past her, and I'm like, what did I just do? I just said yes, but I, I'm not going to wear the, what am I talking about? So I was like, you know what? They'll forget. And then like the next day, the, the assistant that works for her called me up. She goes, hey, congratulations. I heard you're a regular. I go, yeah. And she goes, and I heard you're going to wear the outfit. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so now they wanted me to wear, like, dress up as a mullah on stage. And I, and I was like, how do I get out of this? And I was trying to find a way to get out of it. And I was talking to relatives. I was like, I can't, be a, I can't dress as a mullah on stage. And back then, my father had moved back to Iran uh, for business reasons. And um, the... Uh, uh, um, and, and so he was there. And there had also been this one Iranian guy who used to uh, impersonate the mullahs uh, on Iranian television, make fun of them. And so I guess he'd been at a rally in Westwood where he was doing the mullah character. And some supporters of the Islamic Republic of Iran had shown up and thrown rocks at him and blinded him. So I'd heard about it. I didn't know who the guy was. I didn't know if it was real or not. But I was like, so I called up the club. I go, hey. I re I'm excited about the turban and the thing, but let me just tell you before I do it, the, you know, there was a guy who did it, and they showed up, and they threw a rock, and they blinded him, and my dad's in Iran, so if word gets back, they could go after him, and they might come after the club. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thinking. I swear to God, I'm not kidding. The booker, who was the Mitzi's assistant, she goes, oh, um, let me call you back. <laughs> I swear, five minutes later, Maz, just wear something comfortable. You'll be fine. <laughs> Don't worry about the turban. So I got away from wearing the turban. And uh, thank God. Um, because the thing about Mitzi is, this is the thing about Mitzi. She, she really was someone who everyone's got stories about. Like if you talk to any comedian, they'll tell you their experiences with Mitzi. And Mitzi was uh, really a visionary in many ways. Like she helped, like for, from what I've heard, she helped Roseanne Barr go, you know, get her whole persona together and get the clothing and all that. And, like, a lot of comedians found their character there. So Mitzi had had successes where she was like, you should do this, and they did it, and it worked. But she also had some failures, you know, like, in terms of, like, there was a guy, uh, his name was uh, Jackie Bananas, uh, and, and, and there's a picture of him. At the co if you go to the comedy store, everyone's headshots are there, and there's a guy named Jackie Bananas, and it's a face in a banana suit. And I, and I was asking one of the comedians, I go, who is that guy? And they go, oh, that guy. They go, this poor guy, he used to do an act. And at one point in the act, he used to put on the banana suit. And one night, Mitzi was there seeing it. And she was like, you should be Jackie Bananas. And the poor guy had to be a banana the rest of his life. And then he never, he disappeared. Nobody wants to see a banana. So thank God I didn't listen to Mitzi. Um, but also Mitzi then, to give her credit, she came around in the year 2000. And uh, she's Jewish. Uh, she was watching a lot of news. And there was the latest uprising with the Palestinians in Israel. 
and she felt like there was going to be a need for a positive voice for Middle Easterners in America in the very near future. This is before September 11th. So she wanted to do like a Middle Eastern comedy night. Um, and she used to do, a, a, you know, even though you're a regular at the club, which means you perform throughout the week, she used to do um, a show like the Black Night and Asian Night and Latino Night and whatever. So she wanted to do Middle Eastern Night. So she got like the few Middle Easterners that were doing comedy at the time, me, uh, this guy named Ahmed Ahmed, who's Egyptian-American, Aaron Cater, who's Palestinian-American, and anyone else who kind of seemed Middle Eastern. There was an Indian guy who really wasn't Middle Eastern, but he was there. And it wasn't Russell Peters. It was this other guy. Um, there was, uh, there was an, a guy who was half Armenian. Um, there was a girl who did a belly dance, but she was a white girl. It was real. It was, <laughs> it was this weird thing. And she called it the Arabian Nights. And... Um, what was interesting was we would do our shows and then Iranians would come and Iranians are really proud of being Iranian. And so if someone says, are you Arab? They go, no, I'm Iran, I'm Persian. And people get really offended. I'm like, calm down, you know. But Iranians would come up after the shows. Maz really enjoyed the show. But you know, we are not Arab. I was like, I know, it's called Arabian Nights because that's what she named it. Um, so relax. And... Um, and it wasn't until 2005 when me and a couple of the guys uh, broke off and we called it the Axis of Evil comedy tour to make fun of what Bush had named Iran and those other countries. And then we toured with that. Um, and then in all honesty, it was actually YouTube that I think helped all of us really at the time uh, become better known because I used to be on these email lists. It was before Facebook was really out. And... Um, I would get my own clip, the meow clip that he was talking about, where I talk about Persians like to say we're Persian like the cat meow. Um, they would, I, that would kept circulating, and I was on these email lists going like, hey, look at this Iranian comedian, Iranian-American comedian. And so I kept getting it. I was like, oh, wow, people are getting to know me. Um, and so that was in um, 2007. Um, and, uh, and then been doing it since and, and put out a bunch of my own comedy specials. And the latest one's called Immigrant, and it's on Netflix. Um, and, uh, and I do a lot of Trump material. Um, he just keeps talking. <laughs> God, I mean, I can't, the guy won't stop. I mean, he offended the NFL. I mean, do you understand that? Like, that, I never thought he could offend NFL owners who donated money to him. I, I used to say, I go, listen, if you think he's not going to offend you, he's going to offend you. And he finds a way. To, he's amazing. Remember the chocolate cake? Remember he was talking about the bombs he dropped on Syria, and then he decided to talk about his dessert? Do you guys see that? It's crazy. He, for those of you who don't know it, he was talking about the bombs that he dropped on Syria when the, first of all, there was the video that came out of the Syrian, uh, uh, the, the attack they did that was the chemical weapon attack, and it was a horrible video that was out. And Trump came out and goes, oh, I never knew that was what was happening there. And I'm like, you're the president. No one told you about Syria? And then he decides to bomb Syria, but then he's being interviewed on some political show and he goes, yeah, we were dropping the bomb. And before we, before we bombed uh, Syria, we, we, had, we had this chocolate cake. It was an amazing chocolate cake. <laughs> and I was watching. I go, what? Did his brain tell his mouth? Like, was there a message that was like, tell her about the cake? <laughs> She's going to love hearing about the cake. I got kids. If they talked about chocolate cake in the middle of a serious conversation, I'd smack them. Shut up! <laughs> but that's where we are, people. Um, so, yeah, man. So that's kind of... My life right now, and uh, somebody was just asking me about the representation of Middle Easterners and Muslims and Arabs and stuff in, in media. And I think we've made some progress. I think, you know, you got shows like Aziz Ansari's Master of None. You got uh, uh, um, guys like Kumil Nanjani and uh, Hassan Minaj and Mindy Kaling and all these. You know, I think that because more and more, like I said, when, when immigrants come, they don't know it's an option. But I think the next generation realizes it's an option. And so we're starting to show up and uh, uh, hopefully show us in a different light. I'm currently on a show where I play an Iraqi businessman on a show called Superior Donuts. It's a CBS show. Um, and I still have an accent. Some people are like, why do you still have an accent on this stuff? And I'm like, well, eventually I'll do a character without an accent. Um, but actually, I actually think it's important because the, the character is a concern. He's, he's one of the guys who would vote for Trump. But it, what's interesting is every week that the that the show plays, I, on Twitter I get a lot of people going like, they, they like the character because he gets to say a lot of inappropriate stuff uh, and he's got an accent and I think it's good for people to be laughing at a character that has the accent because I think that it also humanizes the character because they go, oh, he makes me laugh. Um, so we're in an interesting 
uh, era right now. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to keep pushing forward and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get there. And that's it. That's the talk. And I was, I told, uh, I told Hadi, we got a few minutes left that we, we could uh, ask some questions. You, you have a couple questions, is that right? Yeah, we do. T thanks a lot for, for the show. Give it up one more time for Maz Jobrani. Oh, that's, there you go. Yeah, Are those the questions? A, yeah, we have a system of Dory. People post online questions. But before that, I have a question myself listening to your show. Yes. Do I look like Mola in this T-shirt? You don't look like a Mola. You should have worn the outfit and the turban. Well, you we gave you a free T-shirt to wear, and then you said, you know what, I, I, Ronnie and Google, and I'm just, I, I, this is, I, I figured, you know, I want to represent in a nice, you know, uh, you know, nice expensive shirt, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, you don't have to. You want me to wear your shirt? Give me the shirt, I'll wear your shirt, take it off. <laughs> if you want me to wear the shirt that badly, take off your shirt. Will you wear that? Take off your shirt. <laughs> take off the shirt. You have a shirt underneath the shirt. There we go. <laughs> Hadi, this smells like sabzi polo. <laughs> That's a Persian rice. This smells like cologne. We love cologne. Look at this, Iranian Googlers. I'm telling you, man. Gugush. I, I, nev I never thought I would be on my underwear. You look Italian. <laughs> you look Italian. <laughs> if we throw a little pasta sauce on that, yeah. hey. <laughs> it's a Hadi, ciao, e Hadi. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, going forward. <laughs> What's your last name? Zade. Hadi Zade. Yeah. You could do Hadi Zade. Hey, ciao. <laughs> Tell me, bro. We got quite, you want me to go to there? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, you you want to read it? Or sure. How do you deal with the large number of Trump loving conservative Iranians of Los Angeles? I ignore them. Um, <laughs> the idea that they exist just blows my mind, and I can't do anything besides ignore them. There you go. And or. <laughs> get on giant fights on Facebook about how he, the travel ban, are racist towards them and their people. Well, you know, what's interesting is, first of all, arguing on Facebook is, 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 is uh, futile. Don't do it. It's why. Why are you arguing on Facebook? You don't know who the other guy is and how much time he has on his hands. And you're not going to convince him in your I, I stopped arguing a long time ago. So my first advice would be, don't argue on Facebook. If you have an opinion or whatever, put it out there. Let it go. You know how much, like, I've had it before where I, as a comedian, I'll post something. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Someone will come back if I post a serious thing. Stick to comedy, bro. Stick to trying to be funny, dude. And I won't be like, stick to whatever unemployment thing you got going on right now, bro. <laughs> because no, the truth is, it's like uh, the comedians, we have points that we are, we are human beings. We have points of view. So I should be able to express my point of view. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But sometimes when I get that, like someone you know, tries to insult me on social media, I used to be like, oh my God, I, I, I'd be like, I got to come back with a good comeback. I got to, you know, what if I come back with, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And meanwhile, my wife's like, hey, come to dinner. I'll be right there, man. I'm like, you know, <laughs> upsetting me, you know, my kids. I love you, daddy. Shut up. Give me a comeback. You know, uh, it would take, it, would, it, be, it took over my day. And then I was like, what am I doing? And then really, a lot of times, if you like click the person's name, they got like one follower. And you're like, who is this person? And why am I arguing with them? So yeah, right off the bat, I ignore these people that, that argue with me. Uh, uh, and, then, and then secondly, the thing about uh, Iranians that are conservative, I think a lot of immigrants, a lot of people, what this election made me realize is there's more conservative-minded people in the world than progressive-minded people. So one of the things I heard on NPR, uh, there was a Colombian guy who was a Colombian immigrant uh, and with an accent. He was talking about how he voted for Trump. And he said, I voted for Trump because um, I am anti-abortion. Uh, I am uh, pro-marriage uh, being between a man and a woman. You know, all the conservative things that he supported, he was able to hold his nose and be like, I'm voting for Trump. Because if you remember in the, in the debate, Trump was next to Hillary. He goes, if you vote for her, she's going she's gonna to be pulling babies out in the ninth, you know, ninth month, just pulling babies out. And Hillary was like, no, I'm not. Um, 
but people that are you know, supportive of that were like, well, then we've got to vote for him. So I think there's a lot of people that are conservative. A lot of the Iranians that support Trump, um, there's, I know there's Iranian Jewish people that support Trump because they're pro-Israel. I know that there's other Iranians that support Trump because they feel that Trump will overthrow, get rid of this government somehow, because a lot of Iranians are against this government. I personally don't support the Islamic Republic of Iran. I'm, I'm opposed to the government and, and, the, and the lack of freedoms and the human rights violations. Um, by the way, I just said that. I guess I won't be performing in Iran anytime soon. Um, <laughs> But I'm against it, but I also don't think that we should go to war with Iran. But a lot of supporters of Trump feel that, oh, he's going to just get rid of those guys. Because if you go to war with Iran, it'll be messy. A lot of innocent Iranians will die. So uh, that's my response to that one. Uh, how can we win over the older generation, second generation Iranians in LA, Orange County to vote for representatives in 2018 who support us, are against the travel ban, against the wall, et cetera? The representative of Orange County is very pro Trump, but an Iran America is running next time. Uh, can you help? Yeah, actually, I know that guy that's running, uh, Kia, uh, is it Hamadonchi? Kia, I forget his last name right now. Yeah, Hamadonchi, yeah. He's a young guy. He's running on the platform of, uh, um, you know, against the, the, the travel ban. Yeah, Orange County is also very conservative. I mean, I guess the main thing, too, is immigrants in general. I don't know how the Indian community is, but I know that a lot of Iranians... Uh, don't get too involved with politics because we had a bad experience. So they'll be like, don't register. They're going to come get you. you know? And we're like, no, man, got to get involved. So it's just about getting, you got you to gotta, you convince people that they should get politically involved. Otherwise, we end up, like, if you really don't like what's going on, then get involved. Uh, so that's really the, the hope. Do you have writers for stand-ups or it's only you? Uh, Hadi actually helps me write a lot of my jokes. <laughs> the t-shirt bit was rehearsed earlier. <laughs> I think that was a pretty good one. I think we got something. Um, no, as, as a stand-up comedian, I write all my stuff. Uh, a lot of people also will come see you do stand-up, and then they'll see you six months later or three months later, and you have some, some jokes that you did before. And why don't you have new stuff? Because they're used to seeing the late-night show hosts do new material every night. But those guys have a team of writers, and they've got visuals and all that stuff. As a stand-up comedian, even the guys that are the most prolific, a guy like Louis C.K., it takes you like a year or so, at least, a year to two years, to write a whole new hour. You put that hour out, and then you work on the next hour. So yeah, I write all my own stuff. Once in a while, another comedian might be at, the, at my show, and we do this, all of us together. Like if I might be watching another comedian, and I might go up and go, hey, you know that bit you do about the whatever, whatever? You should tag it with this, and we give each other these ideas. So that's that. Do you have thoughts on the Shaws of Sunset show? You know, I actually, so I'm not a big fan of reality television, whether it's Shaws of Sunset or Kardashians, any of that stuff. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard to me. But when Shaws of Sunset came out, I actually did defend it, because again, a lot of Iranians, we, and I don't, know, I don't know how the other immigrant communities are, but we like to complain. Um, but we don't ever do anything proactive. It's like, if you're going to complain, then do something. Uh, so this came out, and they're like, this is not right. They are showing up. We are lawyers and doctors. They should do a show about lawyers and doctors. <laughs> Who's going to watch that? Uh, LA Law. I mean, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, not LA Law. Uh, law and Order. Um, no, but like, who's going to watch a show? Like, people will be like, uh, you should do a show about the Iranian history, you know, history of Iran and uh, Persopolis. And I'm like, you know what? OK, uh, you make it and make it entertaining. Maybe somebody will watch it. But, but this, to me, was actually interesting because I was saying, like, we used to, before Shahs of Sunset, we were known as terrorists. But in Shahs of Sunset, they were, like, partying and getting drunk. So I was like, that's a step in the right direction. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? At least, seriously, at least if someone in middle America sees us, they're like, you know, they like to get drunk just like us, you know? <laughs> uh, this is great. Um, so I thought it was progress. Uh, yeah, so whatever. I, I, don't, I don't watch it. Um, any other questions? Great. Yeah, you know what I was thinking? Yes. I'll leave here soon, but I have to work with them on a daily basis. So. <laughs> That's all right, man. You look good, baby. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do we have any qu live questions from audience? Any live questions? Questions from the live audience. You heard it all. You want to go back to the cafeteria, eat some more? <laughs> does that thing go all day? What time does the cafeteria close? 1.30 p.m. Oh, it's closed now. And dinner, afternoon snacks? Six. Oh, there's, oh, see? I thought it was an open all day. Okay, so you're not as spoiled. So you're, okay, all right. 
But you have the nap room now. That's open all day. Massage. So what happens if you hear it like 2 in the morning? I have questions. You don't have questions? I got questions for you. <laughs> what happens if you hear it 2 in the morning and you want to eat? Is there snack room. snack room? OK, but there's not a guy in the restaurant going like, oh, Jesus, hottie's oh. back again. No. OK, all right. OK. Well, thank you guys for having me. No questions? Nothing? Yeah? OK. Oh, one question. One question. He's got the. Sorry, uh, speaking about um, Trump, in your stand-up, how do you kind of handle Trump jokes because he's so polarizing? I mean, obviously, yeah, he's an easy target, yeah. but it can completely divide your audience. Absolutely, yeah. I've actually had people that get upset. Like I said, people get upset even online. Why are you making fun of him, this and that? And ultimately, listen, as a comedian or as anybody who's creating any kind of comedy or music or movie, whatever you do, you really got to talk about your point of view. This is who I am. I'm very liberal. Uh, you know, I'm pro-gay marriage. I'm pro-abortion. I'm pro. Uh, I'm anti. You know, I'm pro-gun control. All that stuff. So I, that's just who I am. And so, if it bothers somebody that much, then I go, listen. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but that's what it is. And and Trump. A lot of times, listen. The jokes that I do come from. I, I'm, I'm not making stuff up. It's stuff that he said. So that's what I've said as well. Like, it, you know, I, I liked Obama, but if you did a joke about Obama, I, I personally wouldn't be like, how dare you? If it were based in truth, I'd be like, oh, that's funny. So the key is, like, if, if you're not willing to have a sense of humor about your guy, even though your guy uh, is, is basically, uh, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's, he's basically, he's very uh, uh, make fun of a bull. You know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's bringing it on, on, on himself. So if you're not one, then, then I, I've, I've often said, well, then maybe you should go see a therapist and discuss your issues to open up about why it is that you're not willing. Why do you love this guy so much? You know what I'm saying? Because people have come to me before and said, like, you know, I think you offended a few people. I go, well, I think those people should really loosen up a little bit. It's a comedy show. Uh, and, if they, and some people go, well, I don't want to. Sh you shouldn't mix comedy with politics. My favorite comedy mix is politics. So if they're upset, then I go, okay, I, there's nothing I can do for you, you know? And, but that's my point of view. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he has a question. Uh, talking about Trump again, you said that last 40 years haven't really changed the impression about Iranians too much. It's still similar. Yeah. With Trump, I think there's definitely something really, really adverse that has probably not been seen in the last 40 years. Do you think the next 40 would be different, worse? Gosh, I don't know. My, my only hope I have, he was saying about, like, the, you know, a guy said how the, the image of Iranians hasn't changed much since I was a five-year-old and now I'm 45. Um, my only hope is I'm Iranian, my wife is Indian, our kids are mixed. Our neighbor's uh, uh, husband is black, wife is white, their kids are mixed. And I, the more mixed I see, the more of that stuff I see, it gives me some hope because I go, oh, we're, we're starting to... Uh, uh, understand each other. And I even say it to people that are, that are so afraid of Muslims coming and bringing Sharia law. I go, have you ever met a Muslim? Have you ever gone to a, like a Lebanese or Persian restaurant? Or, you know, go, eat, go eat at one of the restaurants and see how nice these people are and how they're just trying to live their lives. And I guarantee you that it would help win people over. But I think a lot of people believe in that fear. When I watched the Republican National Convention, it was like just fear-mongering. And, and even now, it's like a lot of people that, are, that have anti-Islamic ideas, I'm not even that religious, but a lot of people that have anti-Muslim ideas are, are people that think that Muslims are going to bring Sharia law and somehow implement it and then take over. I don't even know how this would work. <laughs> I have no idea how one would implement this thing, but they're that freak, there's people that are that freaked out. So uh, I'm hoping that there's more mixing, you know, and, and people realizing we're just all in it with the same problems and issues. Yes. Uh, why do you think there aren't more Iranian comedians? Um, there are more Iranian comedians. Uh, they're all in prison in Iran. And uh, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you. Well, actually, there are now. It, it, again, it goes back to the generational thing. I think that I was one of the first ones because I just happened to be older. I was in America. Um, so I, there was me over here. There's Omid Jalili, who started in England. And now there's a good number. There's uh, Maximini, the Amir K, uh, Tehran, Kayvon. Uh, a lot of them have one names. Uh, uh, there's a guy named Peter the Persian. There's a handful of us. It's a generational thing, I think. So I think the more we integrate, the more we're going to have people doing comedy. 
and also realizing that we can, and our parents realizing. Uh, now, what's contrary to what used to happen when I, was, when I was first starting out, people, even my parents' friends, would be like, why are you doing this? It's embarrassing. You should be a banker, doctor, you know. But now, I have people come up, listen, Moz, my son, very funny guy. You should put him on stage. <laughs> He's five years old, man. Take it easy. Uh, who else had somebody else? Yes. So I actually have a related question. So what did it take for your parents to kind of decide that your career choice was OK? <laughs> what did it take? <laughs> did they? I don't know. Yeah, my parents really, I, 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 you know, I, I encourage a lot of young people that have immigrant parents, or even if you don't have immigrant parents. I was talking to a guy who wasn't an immigrant who said his parents wanted him to have uh, a, you know, a reputable job. Um, I really feel like if you find your passion and you can really go for it, your parents will come around. So the first time I kind of had that battle with my parents was when I went to Italy for my junior year abroad. My mom didn't want me to go. My dad had just moved back to Iran. My mother and aunt were pushing me. They were saying, you should stay in America to help support the family if they need you. And I was like, no, I need to go to Italy. I've, I've been studying for this. I'm going. And when I went, my mom was upset at me. But a few months later, she came around and embraced it. So the same thing with, this, with, with the comedy. When I did it, I didn't even, it wasn't like I was asking her permission. I was like, I'm going to do this. And I think for her, again, she was nervous. I think that they want what's best for you. They want some kind of secure, job security. But I think it wasn't until she started to see that, oh, you're having success. Oh, and people coming up to her, hey, your son's funny. And oh, wow, you know. So then she started kind of basking in it. Now she'll, now she'll deliver messages. She's like, I was at the airport. And uh, this pre I start talking to a couple, and that's, my mom, that's how my mom talks. I start talking, and they say, you know, they find out I'm your mother. They say they like your comedy, but you need to write new material. <laughs> I go, really? They're bringing messages through you? <laughs> so now she's, she's bringing messages. Yes? Uh, so there are like new comedy shows like Blackish, Fresh Off the Vote. Do you think there's potential for like an Iranian family? Because, because they're like normal, but they have their own eccentric. Yeah, absolutely. No, I hear you. You know what's interesting? You say that uh, the, the clip that you guys saw in the beginning where I was uh, bowling and then I was arguing with this lady and I said, uh, this is the war of the battle of the sexes. I'm Billie Jean. You're Billie Jean. I'm Bobby Riggs. Uh, that was a, a TV show based on a book called Funny and Farsi. Uh, Funny and Farsi was a book that was written by a lady named Firuza Dumas. It's, a, it's her biography. It's really good. Um, in 2009, we filmed that as a pilot for ABC. And we got really close to getting chosen, but they didn't choose us at the time. And I'm convinced that if that show had been produced now with Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat, I think we would have, they would have at least given us a shot. So I think it's coming. You know, Aziz Ansari is doing Master of None, which is an Indian family. So I think it's a matter of time before you start seeing more of that stuff. Anyone else? La demande, no? We're good? All right, guys. Thanks for coming out. Great.